Good morning, everybody, from beautiful and sunny uh, Calgary, Alberta. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the Haskane Hour. My name is Uri Koskinen. I'm the Associate Dean Research and Business Impact at Haskane School of Business. In Haskane Hour, we pair faculty with experts in the field to provide you with unique insights for your business. Today's topic is Terminator 3, Price of the Machines. Oops, sorry, wrong title. The real title is Blockchains Beyond Bitcoin, The Rise of Decentralized Finance. We are webcasting from Calgary, but today we have a record audience from Canada and abroad. Our city is located on the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprising of the Siksika, Pikani, Dainai First Nations, as well as as well as the Tuchina First Nation and the Stony Dakota, including Chiniki, Berspo, and Wesley First Nations. The city of Galgary is also home to Metis Nation of Alberta Region 3. The University of Calgary is situated on land adjacent to where the Bow River meets the Elbow River. And the traditional Blackfoot name for this place is Mokistis, which we now call City of Calgary. I'm looking forward to a lively discussion today, and I'm pleased to be the moderator today. We are very lucky to have two outstanding panelists and speakers today. Alfred Lehar is an associate professor of finance at the Haskins School of Business at the University of Calgary. His research interests include fintech and financial stability. Alfred holds the Canadian Securities Institute Research Foundation professorship Oh, that's a mouthful. To study the impact of blockchain technologies on capital markets. He was also a member of the University of Calgary team that advised Bank of Canada on how to design a central bank digital currency, so-called digital loony. Amy Tehar is an independent lawyer and an entrepreneur and expert on the legal aspects of blockchains. She is the program director for the Oscoot certificate in blockchains smart contracts and the law, as, as well as the OSCUD certificate in privacy and cybersecurity law. Amy was a contributing author for the first editor of a practical guide to smart contracts and blockchains law and a co-author for the fourth cabin second edition. She is presently pursuing a PhD in law. As a reminder, we have a Q&A open so we encourage everybody you to type in your questions at any time. We have three times that we will be pausing to answer your questions. You may also upvote uh, for the questions or, uh, and, or you, know, you want to be answered. I guess there's no downvoting op option, but up upvoting is an option. We may not be able to get all the questions today, which we, we have we expect in a record audience, but we will try our best. So, Colleen, could we have uh, the first poll now? The question is very simple. Did you own any, do you own any cryptocurrencies? As you probably have noticed that both uh, uh, the Bitcoin and the Ethereum had uh, um, headed for record prices yesterday. Uh, Bitcoin has increased over twofold since the beginning of the year and Ethereum over three times. So, do we see a bubble here or a, is this something that uh, is going to be sustained? We'll see. So uh, let's wait for a couple of more seconds and then uh, let's launch the poll results now. What do we see? Do you own any cryptocurrencies? 25% own, 75% do not own cryptocurrencies. So Alfred, let me get to you. So there's so much hype about now Bitcoin and Ethereum, especially hitting the high prices. Is this all hype or are we seeing the end of banks uh, replaced by, by decentralized finance? Uh, I think we are in a very interesting time. I believe that we are in an innovator die situation. So uh, 
there is a lot happening and I believe that a lot of traditional financial institutions don't really see what's coming at them. So beyond Bitcoin, there is a whole uh, system of finance developing in a, what's called decentralized finance. So there is uh, token exchanges, there is lending, there is investment, there is derivatives trading. So just to give an example that is we're talking here about serious money. So we have uh, the token exchange Uniswap is trading 1.2 billion US dollars worth of tokens every day. It's open 24 seven. Uh, there is about 8.2 billion US dollars invested into this token exchange as liquidity pool. In total, we see in this decentralized finance ecosystem over 56 uh, billion US dollars being invested in this. And this is just testing out how this, uh, how this uh, new thing will work. And uh, what we can see from this coming, the trend is that the nature of the commodity that banks are dealing with is changing. So money is changing. So in the past we had money just as a means of payment to buy goods and services. But now what we can do is we can attach computer code to uh, money. And that opens up a lot of new possibilities. So I could give people uh, money very quickly. I can uh, attach conditions to that. So I can give my son money, but he cannot spend it on junk food or in the liquor store. And I could, for example, give, um, when I do a real estate transaction at the moment, I have to rely uh, on a lawyer to safeguard the funds while uh, the whole domain escrow during the transaction in the future, I could have a smart contract uh, that holds these funds in escrow and there's no way that any uh, the smart contract can run away with my money uh, and defraud me. So uh, there is a lot of opportunities here. The nature of money is changing. And I think if banks uh, and other financial intermediaries don't really understand the implications of this, this is going to be hard for them. Thank Amy, you, what do friend. you think? Yeah, Amy, please, sorry. Yeah, I mean, I, I absolutely agree, except um, the fact that smart contracts can't run away with your money, because I, I think they can't. But you know, when we first <laughs> start to think about these mysterious new technologies, and for a lot of us here, probably it still is mysterious, because you know, the vast majority of our attendees don't own crypto. And so we're trying to dispel that, that mysterious nature of it. But when that does happen, and that new tech emerges, and then it later its effects become profound, then everyone really starts to wonder, you know, why wasn't that powerful promise more obvious from the start? Think about um, paper money in the 13th century or personal computers in 1975 or the internet in 1993. And, you know, here we are with DeFi in 2021. And when I think about the DeFi story in terms of how we're in, you know, in, in, in terms of what we're learning, it's, you know, I think, how can we learn to stop worrying and embrace the abstraction? And in a sense, I think it's a continuum that we've been following this evolutionary path with. Money and finance really is an abstraction. You know, in 13th century, um, Kublai Khan embarked on this bold experiment. China at the time was, you know, divided into all these different regions. And so many of those regions issued um, their own coins and that really discouraged, you know, trade with the empire. So Kublai Khan decreed that henceforth. Uh, money would take the form of paper. And he was really ahead of the time of, of his time um, and recognized that what matters about money is not what it looks like or even what it's backed by, but what people believe um, whether people believe in it enough to use it. And that notion, you know, that gold or um, whatever they were using, I think it was silk at the time, um, is somehow more real than paper is, is really a mirage. Gold is valuable because we've collectively decided that it's valuable and that we'll accept goods and services in exchange for it. And so that's no different ultimately from our collective decision that colorful rectangles of paper are valuable and that we'll accept goods and services in exchange for them. So, you know, we're just moving along this path and looking, moving from paper into a distributed and a digital um, nature of finance where algorithms are really replacing this human intervention. And so I think the main point really is, you know, once we collectively decide that something is valuable, then it is. And for more than 80 years, we've been living in, in, in a world in which money can be created really in effect out of thin air. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Amy, for the historical insights. 
And as a side note, we know that now the Chinese are still leading the innovation. They're the first country now to, to adopt the uh, central bank digital currency ahead of the United States, ahead of European Union, and even despite Alfred's best effort ahead of Canada. <laughs> so Alfred, uh, so you, you and I, we are both Europeans. And when we go back to Europe, I hardly ever use cash anymore. The only time they, in Finland I use cash is that I want to avoid taxes and pay, pay contractors for my summer house under the table. Otherwise, everything is, is, is already digital. So what's the big deal? Are we already living, living in, in a digital world where we use credit cards and we transfer, in Europe you transfer money same day for between Finland and Austria and so forth. So what's the, I, what is really the big deal with uh, 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 DeFi? That's a very good question. I agree. Coming uh, going to Europe, I think it is really a little bit ahead of North America in terms of uh, digital forms of payment. Um, but what we are seeing now is a is a very different uh, setup. So uh, at the moment, uh, credit cards, other forms of payment are still kind of a, a digital representation of the traditional kind of banking system. Uh, I see two main differences. First of all, this is still kind of custodial. We still trust the bank uh, and we rely on the banking system uh, to be uh, working there as intermediaries for this. Versus in the future in, in DeFi, this is all trustless. I don't have, I, I still kind of, uh, this is run by smart contracts. There's no central entity that controls everything. And second, now with this DeFi, you can attach computer code to money. So it's not, you kind of open up a whole new dimension here. So we don't just with a credit card, I can still only pay money, but I cannot attach certain conditions. So uh, with uh, DeFi, you can create a lot of interesting business opportunities. So you can uh, automate settlement, for example, where you just uh, pay conditional on receiving the stocks. And if you don't receive the stocks that you want to buy, then you don't pay for them. And so this allows us uh, to have a lot of opportunities that you cannot really have in the traditional financial system. And this will certainly change the way we do finance. Maybe what's, what's your take on this? Is this really a big deal or are we just making a uh, spin, spin out, of, out of nothing? This is a more and a more hill. I think it's an enormous deal, Ario. And I think, you know, in a nutshell, just to further what Alfred is saying, DeFi really is disempowering middlemen and gatekeepers and empowering everyday people via peer-to-peer -peer exchanges. So that's a very simple way of looking at it. You could say that- So are we starting a revolution now? Uh, yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> We're taking, you know, in the same way that uh, it's an unbundling of traditional finance. So it's taking the key elements of the work done by banks, exchanges and insurers today, right? Like lending, borrowing and trading, just like Alfred was saying, and putting it in the hands of regular people. And that's transformative. So, and, and that's, so how might that play out, you might ask. So I would say like, you know, you're putting your savings into an online savings account. You earn half percent of interest on your money. Then the bank turns around and lends that um, money out to another customer at 3% um, and it pockets the two and a half percent difference. With DeFi, people lend their savings directly to others, cutting out that two and a half percent. So the profit um, is going back to the people directly. And you might think, well, I already do that with PayPal. I can send my friends money, but you actually don't because you still have a debit card and you still have a bank linked to those to be able to send those funds. So these peer-to-peer -peer payments are still reliant on centralized financial middlemen to do the work. But decentralized finance is this peer-to-peer -peer system, right? That's not controlled by any centralized institution like a bank. There's no bricks, there's no mortar, there's no chargebacks, there's no no interviews. You deal with your peers directly via algorithmically in a secure environment enabled with blockchain technology, and that's transformational. So we, we're basically cutting out Visa and MasterCard and TD Bank and BMO and RBC and so forth. So those guys are gonna have a premium for, for a big, big surprise if they don't add up in the times, right? Well, I think so. I mean, I, I, Alfred will probably thinks so too. It cuts out centralized institutions, right? And greatly reduces costs and makes loans more affordable and increases deposit rates. You know, transactions are instant, they're secure. 
um, and everybody is treated the same. So it's essentially democratizing finance and re reducing the inequality of opportunity that plagues the current system. Alfred? I totally agree with that. And I, I think it's also very, what is very important is that uh, there is a lot of synergies to be had really. So a lot of back office operations where people check, hey, did you really make that payment that you were supposed to make? Uh, uh, a lot of contracts about how do we divide up profits uh, between amongst each others and everybody checks that they make the right payment. The other people check to have people that check whether they receive the right payment. All of this will be automated. So a lot of uh, back office jobs, uh, a lot of accounting jobs, a lot of um, even, sorry to say that Amy, even simple lawyer jobs uh -huh. might go away because you can put all these contracts on the on the blockchain and they execute automatically. We can trust that system and we can uh, make sure that everybody gets the right payment that they deserve. And the, this increases efficiency a lot. And so uh, the banks that hopefully this, these benefits will be passed on to the consumers and the banks who are not kind of ahead of this and don't realize these efficiency gains will be competed uh, away and out of business. So uh, hey, I so, think, yeah. Alfred, so let me. So we are getting a lot of excellent questions in, in, in the Q and A. So let me let me uh, allow for a little bit of uh, audience participation. As first first question. So and then, let's start with Amy, and then we go back to Alfred. So what industries do you think, or industries or businesses, you you think will become some of the first ones to adapt blockchains, or alternatively benefit the most? For the first so increase in transparency of transactions. So what do you think? I mean, is, is, of course, I mean, you have to have some businesses, some industries adapting this first as a bad means, means of payment. So Amy, who, who do you think would be the first mover that would benefit the most? Yeah, like if we can just frame that a little bit more narrowly than blockchain uh, to, to, to DeFi, because uh, I think that's what we want to focus on. Absolutely, so yes. Uh, traditional financial transactions. So anything from payments, trading securities and insurance to lending um, and borrowing, that's already happening with DeFi. So those, you know, th those are emergent and happening to in billions of dollars. Um, decentralized exchanges, you know, right now, cryptocurrency investors are already using centralized exchanges like Coinbase, for example, but decentralized exchanges are really facilitating that peer to fi peer financial transactions and letting users retain control over the money. Like we're just saying, e-wallets, uh, DeFi developers are creating um, digital wallets that can operate independently of the largest cryptocurrency exchanges and give investors access to everything from crypto to blockchain-based games, for example, stable coins, you know, yield harvesting, NFTs, non-fungible tokens, flash loans, and uh, you know, Alfred will talk about, about more of flash loans later, I'm sure, but those are some of the early emergent use cases that we already see happening. So, so, so these are some of the business applications. But Alfred, what do you think? It, what what would be the first industry? Would it be the real estate industry or or some uh, some consumer goods that would start adapting uh, uh, DeFi and accepting cryptocurrency or or the digital loonies as payments? Do you have any any ideas on that? It's kind of hard to say. I think uh, a lot of industries are still relying on very complicated settlement process like container shipping there's still paper that's kind of moving around in uh, and that will all go away and uh, settlement will be automatically triggered on blockchain payment systems uh, there is a lot of opportunities in in many fields but i think where this will really be happening first is stock exchanges so as soon as a trusted entity like jp morgan comes in and says here we put 10 Apple, uh, 10,000 Apple stocks in our vault and issue 10,000 tokens that represent these Apple stocks, it will take about two minutes before these stocks are trading on one of these DeFi exchanges. And so once that is done, then the, the floodgate will open and we'll see a lot of trading moving to that, to this space. And so uh, that is really something that's very easy to be done. And I think it will not take long before we, if we see that happening big time. The technology is there, it's tested, it works. And so all we need is some kind of interface to the, uh, to the real financial assets that we have. So it, it sounds like that, that, uh, that the most innovative banks should try to get ahead of the curve 
and not wait until they, they, they're going to be kind of obsolete and say, we want to leave this revolution and we want to have part of the action. And if, if it destroys our margins a little bit, but even slim margins, our margins are better than no margins. I think totally. And, and I think there is still room for banks. We will still need banks. Somebody needs to decide whether I'm credit worthy or not and make that decision. Uh, banks still, people still need advice what to do with their uh, money. But the banks that will embrace this uh, will be leading the pack and the financial institutions and also companies uh, who embrace this, who realize the synergies and efficiency gains earlier will have a competitive edge over companies who think, oh, who knows if this is coming. And then when it's coming, it's too late because at that time you won't be able to hire any talent. You won't be able to hire any experts uh, who understand how this works uh, and you'll be behind. So. So Amy, let, let me pivot, pivot to you now, because I mean, this is a kind of a lawyer, lawyer type question. Uh, because I know you, you, you're a specialist in that area. Uh, are you worried about money laundering? Because we now we're talking about all the positive sides of, of uh, decentralized finance, but decentralized finance is also anonymous and it could give cover to all kinds of criminals to launder money all around the globe. Is that a big, big concern? Um, I think, you know, to, just to step back a little bit, I think to answer your question, to be successful, blockchains and DeFi by extension must be trusted. Um, so they can produce immutable consensus over a transaction history. They can't guarantee uh, you can trust who is transacting, you know, or, or what is transacted or who can change the rules. So um, yes, it's a concern. And to give, to, to give you a practical example, this isn't a money laundering example, but when someone exploited a hack to steal $60 million from the Dow, or when 150 million of cryptocurrency was locked irretrievably in the parity wallet, um, thanks to a programming bug, the blockchains you know, themselves immutably executed the undesired transactions. And dealing with those Inevitable problems is the domain of law, regulation, and governance, and precisely why we have KYC, AML um, regulations and laws um, governing our existing uh, financial situation. So it doesn't worry me in any more than our current state of affairs, <laughs> which is actually pretty, pretty lacking. Um, and I think what it does point to, Yurio, is that law has much to contribute to the blockchain community. So concerns about money laundering, um, and not just money laundering, but consumer protection and financial st stability do not disappear even when um, cryptography works as promised. And I think that's one of the risks of it, right? Because taxation doesn't become unnecessary when there is a new mechanism removing money secretly. You know, disputes don't go away because a computer can execute a transaction without inter intervention. Bad actors will act badly. And all these scenarios will give rise to call for legal or regulatory action. Um, so if the community flatly rejects every effort to ensure compliance with legal obligations, you know, the blockchain will be an outlaw technology active in the dark spaces online, but largely irrelevant to the mainstream economy. And that would be a tragic waste of potential. So yeah, I think we should definitely take it very seriously and a lot of other legal considerations as well. Good so question. Sounds, so sounds like, Amy, what you're suggesting that the lawyers will be busy going forward, but bankers might be in trouble, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think so. I mean, if you ask, like, can cryptographically secured computer code automatically enforce agreements and replace the messiness of lawyers, courts, and contracts? I get that all the time, right? Like, it's a, oh, lawyers are going to go away. No, they're not going away. That's, you know, and some people think that's the promise of, of blockchain technology. Blockchain facilitates trusted transactions that don't require trust in any particular party or intermediary. But, you know, not necessarily, because it turns out that while you know, cyber space is nowhere. People and companies are very much, um, that the deliver the services are very much somewhere. And, you know, you've got all these smart contracts. Contracts are very powerful means of generating trust because they backstop this human, you know, voluntary human commitments with formalized legal enforcement. And so you've got these blockchains based smart contracts that are really designed to offer a similar kind of confidence through transactional immutability. 
um, that fact by the cryptographic integrity of a blockchain ledger. But immutability is, you know, really poses an interesting set of legal and regulatory challenges. What happens if a transaction is plainly illegal or harmful and no one has the capability to prevent it? Or the transaction could be technically valid, but needs to be changed because of mistake or because um, circumstances have changed. So immutability of the blockchain really creates this potential for catastrophic catastrophic failures as well, with no clear means of remediation. And for all those reasons, I think, oh, you know, oh my the God. <laughs> there's this is, law this is, this is, is the law of the blockchain's destiny area. <laughs> Strong feelings about it. I was talking about chapter three, the rise of machines in the beginning. Maybe it's really true. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> we attacked, yeah, attacked by the Skynet. <laughs> Alfred, you're the finance guy. What do you think? Yeah, well, uh, I don't know. Uh, that might take down the system at some point in time. No, I don't think so. I think we the way it is. We started talking about the Dow hack. Uh, Alfred, just say, I'll be back. Yeah, I'll be back. How does that sound? Uh, with Excellent. my Australian accent. Um, no, I I think the way this will develop is that we that we move in a in a direction where we have trusted parties in blockchain. So that's what central bank digital currency will do for us. So uh, this will not be as free as, uh, uh, as everybody, as Bitcoin is or Ethereum is, uh, but it will still be, there will be a trusted party in there and that trusted party uh, can resolve these catastrophic problems. So uh, the same way we trust today the Bank of Canada um, when, we use the Canadian dollar, I think we will also eventually trust the Bank of Canada uh, to be there as a kind of um, in a stronger role when issuing central bank digital currency to resolve these problems. If something really goes wrong, they could potentially fix that and we would trust them that they uh, act in the best interest of all the citizens and do that for us. Uh, having a central party uh, that we all trust comes with a bunch of benefits. First of all, we can enforce these uh, anti-terrorist and anti-money laundering laws, which is what 99.9% .9 of the people really want. Uh, they want to invest in a system where they don't trade with terrorists. Uh, they don't want to support that. So uh, this, is, this is one great benefit of having a central bank in there. And if the system is well designed, we can still have anonymity. We can still have that the government doesn't know where I spent my money. Uh, so it's a question of designing a good system where we get some benefits um, uh, from having a trustworthy party in the middle and um, avoid some of these catastrophic failure losses that Amy mentioned before. Can I, can I now pivot a little bit? So we've been, we've been talking about trust and uh, transparency. Uh, let me pivot now, of course, Alfred, you as finance professor, well, I, like I am, and we don't really talk about social justice issues, but maybe I can turn first to Amy. And uh, so uh, if we pivot now away from cash towards the decentralized finance and blockchain, is this leading some marginalized people, perhaps like indigenous people or, or, or uh, some other, other marginalized groups behind? How can we make sure that, that, that the, the marginalized people can also benefit from the, from the coming financial revolution? Yeah, well, I think, I mean, by nature of, um, you know, this decentralized um, capability that it automatically opens up and democratizes finance to a large extent um, because, you know, it's greatly reducing costs. Uh, and making loans more affordable and increasing deposit rates. So that is really re has the, um, the potential to reduce the inequality of opportunity that I think does plague current systems. Um, and so it, absolutely, I, I, th I think we should um, facilitate that to, to the greatest extent possible. And, and I think one of the key ingredients would be that we have to have a reliable and affordable high-speed internet all over the country, including, including the marginalized. Because otherwise, if, if you don't have a high-speed high internet, it's very, very hard <laughs> to hook up with the decentralized finance, right? I think, I think that's where, again, a central bank digital currency, if it's well-designed, could do a lot of benefits. So you can design these systems in a way that you can transact even offline. Uh, 
which would be essential in Canada if you drive around and your car breaks down, you still want to be able to pay the tow truck uh, driver uh, if in a place where there's no internet, of which in Canada there are many. And uh, also DeFi offers a lot of opportunities. If you think about who pays a lot of the fees to the banks for overdraft, for kind of credit cards, these 25% uh, rates, uh, for your credit card debt, a lot of them are poor people or, or people that kind of are, uh, it's not the wealthy that, that pay 25% uh, interest on their credit card debt. And so DeFi could really benefit, I think here, a lot of disadvantaged people too. Think about payday loans. There is already FinTech applications that allow you to uh, get an advance on the hours that you already worked uh, in your job. So if you are a week away from your payday, but you've also accumulated so many hours of work, you can take out a, a pay advance using FinTech applications. That technology exists today and that can really help a lot of disadvantaged people that now today rely on payday loans. So I think this could be a real win for and, and I, improve uh, inequality. I, I tend to agree, although I would, I'm, I'm not sure it's necessary to have a CBDC to, to um, enable this. I mean, I think that's the beauty of, you know, having the freedom to use a number of different um, for, mediums of exchange. But, you know, consider it, there's around the world, I think there's like 1.7 billion that are unbanked and, and not just unbanked, but small businesses, um, even those that have banking relationships often have to rely, like you were saying, Alfred, on this high cost financing, like credit cards, because transactional banking excludes them. So you've got these high costs that also impact retailers who lose 3% on every credit card sales transactions. And, and the, those total costs for small business, especially, it, it's enormous by any metric. Um, and I think the result from that is less investment and decreased economic growth. And so you know, what this enables is this, um, and Alfred always talks about these Lego blocks, which I, I just love, but we see the scaffolding of these, this shiny new Lego block city, right? And it's not a renovation really of existing structures, it's this complete rebuild from the bottom up. So finance becomes, you know, it will, has the potential to become accessible to all. So you've got these quality ideas that can be funded no matter who you are. Um, a $10 transaction is treated identically to a hundred million dollar uh, transaction and you've got savings rates that increase um, and borrowing costs decrease and you've got these these wasteful middle layers um, just we can remove those wasteful middle layers and ultimately we see DeFi I think as the greatest opportunity of the coming decade and um, we can really look forward to the reinvention of finance as we know it because because of this this ability to uh, democratize finance so I, I, and make I it love, more accessible to all. I love this because, I, and as a finance professor, we always everybody else thinks that we are the bad guys. <laughs> and now we, uh, we now we become social justice warriors. I mean, we fight. There we, you go. We fight, yeah, we right. did, guys. I, I love it. <laughs> so, and now, on, on top of the hour, can we have a second poll now, and then we we we, we can then have a second half an hour of uh, conversation? Thank you so much. So there's three questions. And as a, as a reminder, DeFi means decentralized finance. Uh, so we, sometimes we use too many acronyms, but DeFi is decentralized finance. All right, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's conclude the polls now. So let's look at a little bit of the results. So very few people have invested in stable coins, very, very people who have invested in decentralized exchanges, uh, very few people have invested in the DeFi lending. So this is still a marginalized business. 
uh, people have heard about it, even majority have never heard about it. So I think uh, we have a lot to unpack for the next next half an hour. So let's start with the stable coins. What's the difference between a stable coin and an ordinary cryptocurrency like, like Bitcoin, which definitely is not a stable, a stable coin. So what's the difference between stable coin and uh, let's say a Bitcoin? So stable coins are tied in value to a fiat currency. So and fiat is, currency means like Canadian dollars. Like dollar. US dollars or Canadian dollars. So I read that uh, one bank in Canada issued recently a, a crypto Canadian uh, stable coin, but most of the stable coins we see today in the market are tied to the US dollar. And the goal is that one token that you buy in these uh, markets is always worth one US dollar. And you can use that to make payments and not be exposed to the crazy price swings that Bitcoin has uh, and things like that. Uh, and that's just one way to potentially invest your money or to keep your money in the DeFi space uh, without being exposed to enormous price risks going up and down. So stable coins offer uh, some great opportunity and a kind of the private answer to central bank digital currency. So uh, we do see that Facebook, for example, has the plans to issue uh, what they've previously called Libra and now they call it D DM, which is also the idea of being a stable coin where uh, one digital um, uh, token here represents the value of one uh, US dollar, I think in their example. So, um, and they plan to do that for multiple currencies. So stable coins offer this stability and, and the interface to fiat currency. So in a sense that if, if you want to ever have a cryptocurrency be, be in a medium of payment, the stability is very, very valuable. Because if, if I may, it's try to pay with Bitcoin and it's, it's, it's hugely volatile from day to day, that might be very risky. So I, would, I want to have something that is tied to the Canadian dollar if I want to pay let's say my, my taxes. Right, Amy? Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, so Amy, so also people were asking about, uh, or we, we were asking the people about uh, uh, DeFi lending. So if somebody is interested in a decentralized lending, how would that happen? I mean, we, so most people never have even heard about it. So let's say if I'm, I want to borrow and you are a rich lawyer and you want to you wanna lend me some money, why would you lend me money if I can get your get your, your, your uh, uh, cryptocurrency and then run, run down to Mexico and keep my money. What, what pro prohibits that? What's, what's the kind of the, how do you provide security in uh, decentralized lending? How do you provide security in decentralized lending? So the, yeah, that, how do you, that, that if, I mean, if I'm a dishonest person, there's, no, there's nobody screaming me, like in traditional lending through banks. Banks will check my creditworthiness, but in decentralized lending, there's nobody checking that I am a good person. I, I could be a completely bad, bad character and, uh, and uh, run with the money to Mexico and have a good, have a good time there. What, what stops that in decentralized lending? Well, I mean, right now, nothing really stops it because, and I think this is why we haven't seen mass adoption because, um, and then why DeFi isn't attracting the masses precisely because the same legal protections that regulated financial institutions that are what, what's supposed to um, protect investors isn't really there. So ironically, I, I would say the relatively weak regulatory framework for crypto means that the ultimate harm that you know, it can do at the moment is small. But another thing to remember is a lot of these loans are all collateralized heavily. Um, and so, for example, in flash loans, like if you want to take advantage of arbitrage opportunities, um, you know, the cryptocurrency loans that are borrowing, borrowing and repaying uh, funds in the exact same transaction. So borrowers have the potential to make money by entering into a contract encoded on the Ethereum blockchain um, and no lawyers are needed. <laughs> hey, bravo. That's, I love that. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, you know, that borrows the fund to execute the transaction and then repays the loan instantly. And so if the transaction can't be executed or it'll be at a loss, the funds automatically go back to the loaner. And if, if you do make a profit, you can, you know, you can pocket that uh, minus any interest charges, charges or fees. So um, it's really, you know, flash loans, I think, are, you know, decentralized arbitrage. But those are, are two ways, like buyer beware, because the regulatory protections um, are not there to this in, the, in this uh, because of jurisdiction, all kinds of jurisdictional considerations. And then also we've got this um, collateralized protection, I think. Alfred, would you uh, would you agree? Yeah, a lot of these loans work that there is collateral pool, so you have mm -hmm. to uh, you have to provide some kind of collateral uh, to take out the loan. Now there is, of course, also problems with this and and mm -hmm. uh, and issues. What if the value of the collateral drops? Then what usually happens is that your loan gets liquidated. We can see that a little bit like margin trading today. If you uh, buy stocks on margin and all of the va uh, sudden the value of the stocks fall down, the broker also liquidates your position. Uh, this is a similar idea that we see here in the DeFi space. Uh, at the moment, most of the collateral is um, other cryptocurrencies, but we can think about uh, in a future world where you can tokenize a lot of other assets, uh, you could use those as collaterals. At the moment, we see that, um, for example, um, digital art is being tokenized and you buy uh, what's called a non-fungible token, which is a digital representation of the ownership right in this art. and. Uh, you can tokenize your house, you can tokenize your car, and then you can use those tokens as collateral uh, to get a crypto loan. And so- now, Fred, Let me stop you there. So if I want to call, uh, tokenize my house and use my house as a collateral, how do you make sure that I don't already have a huge mortgage on my house? That it's actually, I, I have equity in my house and not just, okay, 100% mortgage. Uh, well, the, there will be services, uh, a demand for service providers who try to estimate the value of your house because the person who might give you the mortgage uh, might sit somewhere in New Zealand and might have no idea how much houses in Calgary are worth. Uh, so there will be some kind of uh, service providers out there who try to give an estimate of what the value of your house is. But uh, what is observable is that you can only use your token uh, once on the blockchain, right? So if you have already a mortgage out on your house, uh, then everybody can see how much, how big that mortgage is. And then they can decide whether they want to borrow you any additional money on top of that or, or whether that's it. And but so, Alfred, if it, but if I, if I, 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 have, I haven't borrowed from, from uh, decentralized lending, let's say I have borrowed from a regular bank and now I want to borrow more from decentralized lending. How do these people who are providing me financing to three centralized, decentralized lending, how would they know that I already have an existing mortgage on the side? I think at some point in time, uh, as, as it will get tokenized, the banks will also want a claim on your token that you have that digitally represents your house. So I think uh, institutions and legal frameworks will adopt in a way that uh, you cannot do this kind of trick. And that's something where the lawyers will, will help us to figure out the clever system uh, to uh, come up with uh, specific ownership rights and how we can then use these ownership rights as collateral in the lending market. So Alfred, this, so this is like a typical, typical economist answer. Let's, let's assume a screwdriver, I mean, a screwdriver doesn't but can I, can I, can So, can so I, Amy, how do we make this reality? Yeah, just if I could jump up, jump in, there's a, there's a few things at, at play, right? Like NFTs, in this context, they would probably... Rep Sorry, well, what is an NFT? Sorry, a non, thank you, Ariel, a non-fungible token. So typically they would represent, you know, and they're, they're, a digital ver they're a digital receipt. So we already have existing systems in place for transfers of title, right? So if you can just replace that, that deed with an electronic version, which could be a non-fungible token that could also be used as collateral in the future. But I think what is what's really important for the audience to understand is that 
oftentimes there's this flaw in reasoning and that is there's a failure to distinguish the contractual execution from the enforcement. And that hap this happens all the time with um, when people start to think about what smart contracts can enable, right? Because carrying out specified steps in an agreement is the easy part, which is you know what a smart contract does really well. Um, it is, it's not particularly a novel phenomenon, you know, billions of dollars of derivatives uh, of derivative trades are executed each day with no human intervention, intervention, right? It's just like following a series of programmed instructions and computers are programmed with contractual terms and perform those trades when there's specified circumstances occur. So the difference is that with like what we'll call a computable contract, execution of the agreement is automated, but the enforcement isn't. So the parties involved can revise the agreement before performance and a court can reverse it after. And if going back to again, smart contracts that, that are automating that contractual enforcement by ceding all power to the decentralized network, maintaining that ledger. So automating the contractual enforcement isn't as neat and tidy as automating the execution. That's again, why we're gonna <laughs> continue to need lawyers. <laughs> so no matter how fast they calculate, there are just some things that computers can't do as well as humans. And the same is true uh, when, you're, when you start to think about smart contracts and, and non-fungible tokens being um, ap applied in, for the transfer of major um, types of real property, for example, um, in, in addition to the rights associated with intellectual property. So, um, you know, there's no really good way to represent terms as reasonable or best efforts in code. And sometimes, you know, the meaning of these contracts is best understood in terms of the intent of the parties rather than the precise meaning of the terms that are that are used. And I think that's really important when you start to think of turning like real property into a digital representation of value that can be used as collateral in financial transactions. Can I ask you the, the both of you actually, a little bit related question to regulation. I don't know, uh, and this relates to the Bank of Canada and the Canadian monetary system. So it's so one of the most important uh, element components of Canadian money supply are deposit checking accounts in banks. And if people are now maybe taking money out of the traditional financial systems and put it in, in at some point in the cryptocurrencies, how do you see a Bank of Canada shaping its policies to address the rising popularity and acceptance of pure, uh, cryptocurrencies in terms of finance, financial stability, controlling inflation, and so forth? So Alfred, let me start with you because you are also a financial stability expert, and then I'll put people to Amy. I think that uh, these free market um, uh, Decentralized finance, cryptocurrencies like Ether, Bitcoin, and whatever are great. Uh, they uh, offer opportunities here to test out this new technology. They are decentralized. There's no government behind them. But it also has some drawbacks. So uh, if you lose your um, access code to your wallet, you're on your own. If you lose your ATM card, you can go to the bank and, and ask for a new one by showing a government ID. So the same doesn't work for Bitcoin. So I think uh, coming back to, to your question, so these private sector solutions can only go so far. Uh, I think at some point in time, we, the either private sector crypto networks will see government regulation. We see that Coinbase, for example, is uh, uh, listing today. Uh, they want to subject themselves to all the rules and laws. Uh, and that's perhaps a good thing because some institutional investors only want to invest with other companies that subject themselves to those rules. So I think the, the system will adopt. At some point in time, uh, in order to have monetary sovereignty, governments will be forced to issue their own central bank digital currency because uh, just relying on these private sector coins has a problem. So if you think about Facebook's digital currency, what if you do a Facebook post that you don't like Zuckerberg and then he locks you out of the financial system? So that's not really a good alternative going forward. And should we really rely on, on an American company to make all the payments in Canada? I don't know, it's hard to regulate, it's hard to uh, 
enforce uh, legal contracts with them because they sit somewhere else in the world. So um, there's pros and cons to this private sector, but I think the central banks will adopt and will issue their own cryptocurrency. So central banks need to do, uh, think about the financial system. And then uh, we need to think about also, which is we are a federal country. We need to also think about federal laws and provincial laws. So AB, I mean, I mean, does this our federal structure complicate getting getting the, the proper regulations and laws in, in, in place? Yeah, I mean, I think um, a few things. I, I like to respond to what Alfred said about public and private governance around the banking uh, and monetary system. But just before I do that, really quick, um, to respond to the challenges on the regulatory front, you know, for so many years, our practice on a regulatory basis has to been uh, to look at in regulating the intermediaries, right? And, and, and today, often what is, being, what is happening is we're regulating the content rather than the channel. And I, I think, I mean, part of my own research is looking into, you know, what is the advisability of looking at how we can regulate um, the, the channel rather than the content because blockchain and its associated technologies are sort of what we call you know, supranational. They ex exist outside of, you know, one jurisdiction. And so that I think requires a whole new regulatory approach. But just going back to what Alfred was saying about, you know, the markets emerging and the, and the government taking control of that, I think it's been really a commonly held belief and has been for a long time that markets can only emerge after government sets the rules of the game and creates an effective regulatory framework. Um, you know, and th there's a number of scholars um, Raghuram Rajan argues the institutional form of the bank um, actually arose to improve transaction possibilities over what was contractable through the marketplace. And he suggests the regulation sometimes helped in this, right? And that this should be thought of as an integral part to the institutional structure of banks. But if you look back in history at the world's first three uh, major stark markets in the 17th um, century, Amsterdam, 18th century London, and 19th century New York, um, New York developed uh, like these amazingly sophisticated financial contracts, even though most were unenforceable in courts of law. And, you know, other scholars like Ed Stringham, for example, take the position that private regulation made the, the market actually more attractive by screening firms, creating listing requirements and requ requiring disclosure for investors. So in essence, the private incentives for increasing that transparency and in increasing flawed gave them this competitive advantage. And those requirements weren't set by the government, but by the market participants themselves who won or lost based on the attractiveness of that venue. So as it relates to stock exchanges, you know, he points out the exchanges failed, to, that exchanges that did fail to adopt those, um, that those, um, rules or that accepted burdensome ones were at competitive disadvantage. So, I and I think the same thing, you know, we'll start to see that as well with um, the, the current DeFi and the CBDC. And I, I think that's part of perhaps maybe CBDC's, um, you know, benefit is that it will increase this competitive requirement of our five major banks to increase um, the benefits for the consumer at the end of the day. So that might okay. be positive, positive. Sorry outcome of it. So if, I mean, if, if I can interpret you, so then you kind of suggesting that private regulation and self-regulation self and uh, official public sector regulation could, could be complements working together. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think I think they will totally coexist going forward. Um, there will be this private sector world where you have Bitcoin and other crypto privately issued cryptocurrencies. There will be an official kind of government issued money, digital money. We will have both. Consumers will have more choice. There will be more competitions. Governments have to think about what do we do to make. Um, they will also face some. They will not have a monopoly for issuing money. They will face some competition. They have to think about what do we have to do to be competitive. And so if anything, competition will go up and that should benefit most people. So we have, okay, we have now uh, seven minutes to left. Let me give one, uh, one, one or two more questions and then we have closing statements. And then unfortunately, we, as we promised, it's only 60 minutes and we could have probably gone into another 60 minutes. <laughs> And then lunch break, another 60 minutes. Uh, so this is a question uh, about uh, China. 
and um, some, including uh, Peter Thiel, the famous famous venture capitalists, and uh, and uh, uh, written 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 a fantastic book on uh, from uh, from uh, one to zero, uh, has suggested that this may be just China. China is mining, 60% of Bitcoin is mined, mined in China. And this may be part of effort to undermine the US dollar as a reserve currency with billions of US dollars being invested into Bitcoin mined in China. Effectively, Bitcoin can also be a financial weapon under this lens. Any thoughts on this? Can this, can this rise of uh, decentralized finance and uh, cryptocurrencies, can they, they undermine the preeminence of the United States dollar. Any, any thoughts on that? This is a huge question. Totally. I think, I think to absolutely. Uh, so I see two potential threats here. So one, uh, China could all of a sudden shut down, could essentially destroy Bitcoin. It's the only country that has the power to destroy Bitcoin. So, or seriously uh, harm Bitcoin for uh, an extended period of time. So, uh, that is uh, certainly one area of concern, but I think the real competitor to the dominance of the US dollar is the digital yuan and other digital currencies. So at the moment, a lot of the, what Donald Trump did that they threatened to shut off Chinese companies from the global banking system, that will become an empty threat in a few years when people use digital yuans uh, and digital euros and digital Canadian dollars for payment, then no country can just impose that big threat on to shut off companies from the global financial system. Maybe what are, what are your thoughts? I mean, is this kind of a is this is China a threat or a solution for our our global monetary problems? Well, it's interesting, right? That we started out in the 13th century looking at Kublai Khan right, bringing in this new type of money. And the point being, you know, money is what we think it is and what it, it can be used for um, exchange, in exchange for goods and services is, you know, what we collectively agree that is, whether that's, you know, it doesn't matter what, what country's name you apply uh, to establishing a new type of cryptocurrency. I think we have to, you know, watch uh, for all of those, um, centralized types of solutions and perhaps guard against them and you know embrace this decentralized um, power of what the technology enables uh, with regard to the various types of cryptocurrencies that are available now and make use of those there's you know countries do that now with paper money having a digital you yeah. know just because china is using a, a digital currency uh, doesn't change probably that it, it might be trying to do that already with the American um, dollar with its existing currency. <laughs> and of course, the, 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 I mean, the US dollars as a reserve currency gives US a huge power because US can basically borrow in an unlimited fashion because it is the reserve currency. And if that's gonna change, it's gonna be a big, big change for the United States and, 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 its, and the fiscal policies. So yeah. let's be, uh, uh, Amy, so we have three minutes. So would you have some, what are your final thoughts on, on uh, the future of uh, decentralized finance? How, how soon are we going to see this becoming really, really mainstream? Is it, is it a couple of years away, 10 years away? What are your thoughts on this? Um, I mean, I think, I think it's imminent. Um, we're trying to catch um, a regular, uh, we being, you know, law, I should say, um, is trying to catch up. Um, and I, I think, you know, what we were, sorry, going back, I'm just, my mind is thinking of something, Ariel, about government control over money. You know, Hayek was the first to write that it, um, it has the defects of all monopolies. One must use their product, uh, even if it's unsatisfactory and above all, it prevents the discovery of better methods of satisfying a need for which a monopolist has no incentive. And so that's what we need to guard against with, you know, these, these country issued private currencies. Um, you know, they're, they could be potentially more prone to weaknesses. So I think, yeah, it's now we have to be on guard against it. And the most important thing is to keep a balanced approach um, for understanding um, new technology and and to remain um, 
you know, not, not believe too greatly or strongly in either side uh, because that can lead to disaster. Um, and so trust through cryptography and economic incentives without human governance is, is great. Um, but if you believe in either side too strongly, that can, you know, as I was just saying, lead to disaster. So I think finding that proper balance is the path that will lead to valuable insights. And I think that is really one of the key takeaways. So Alfred, no, I'm sorry, you have only 30 seconds. Sorry. Actually, no, 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 I knew you were perfect. Uh, I was talking too much. So Alfred, 30 second answer. When are we gonna see a digital loaning? How many years? I would think um, three years, uh, three to five years, something like that. I think we'll see that soon, but I think sooner than that, we'll see decentralized finance and the technology uh, coming into more and more businesses. Uh, so whatever you're doing, real estate, uh, whenever your business issues invoices, whenever your business raises money, uh, collects payment, I think every business does that. You need to be ready. This technology is there. It will come very quickly. It's already proven. It's trading billions of dollars every day. That will come very quickly. And I really encourage everybody to be ready for this. So ready for the revolution. Skynet yes. is taking over. Uh, yes, right. I think so. Thank you everyone for joining us today. We had uh, 374 participants across Canada, both East Coast and West Coast and Prairies, abroad as well. A record of this to, uh, today's program will be available on our website soon. As a reminder, I would like to say that we are uh, hosting the final Haskell now for this season sometime in June. So please remember to check your inbox for your invitation to join. And also, I would like to remind you that you will be getting an evaluation survey in your email. Please look for it and send it in our way, our way with your comments. And I'm really grateful for our truly excellent panelists today. Amy and Alfred, thank you so much. You were, you were outstanding. And audience, thank you for joining us today. And I'm very happy that you'll be able to join us. And I'm looking forward to connecting with you again soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.